Two girls in love at the end of the world. No one tells you how the world ends. It's slow, and it's dark, and it hurts. The worst part isn't the acrid smoke filling the air, or the flooded coasts, or the people intent on harming rather than surviving. It isn't even the dying. It's doing it with someone you love. The restaurant had been a godsend. We discovered it two weeks after fleeing our last spot and barred the door at the bottom of the basement stairs with an industrial steel fridge, knowing intimately what happened when you trusted a locked door alone. It took us the better part of that first morning to move it into place, but turned on its side, the fridge ran halfway up the door and more than doubled its width. Do you think we'll get to stay this time? Lila asked, hope dancing across her dimly lit face. Maybe for a while. Would that thing block in the door and all this food? You bet. I only let myself meet her smile for a second. I didn't have it in me to lie longer than that. When the smoke got bad enough to fill the windowless basement with haze and people came with their noise and ill intent, the fridge took on a new purpose. We laid down our sleeping bags and packed what food we could fit inside before jamming a stick into the corner to allow for a small supply of air. Then we climbed inside and mustered the last of our waning energy to close the door over us. It was only supposed to be until the worst passed. The thing about the world ending, though, is the worst never passes. It gets eaten by whatever comes next, and whatever comes next is always worse. Another thing they don't tell you. Being in love at the end of the world isn't beautiful like the songs say. You want to know what it actually is? Imagine being plunged into an ice bath again and again and again. It's relentless pain and the knowledge it will never, ever stop. Not even when you're dead. Not while the person you love lives. Loving Lila was worth it. It always had been. She had butter yellow waves past her shoulders and a laugh that could fix the world if it would only listen. I'd taken one look at her in senior art class and knew. Snow dusted the ground by the time our lips finally touched and I knew what it was to feel right for the first time. I vowed never to stop kissing her as long as I lived. I suppose that made me lucky. I got to keep my promise. We called it a slumber party the first night we slept in the fridge, playing pretend to soften our fear. Snuggled into sleeping bags, we held hands and told secrets and kissed, just like we had every weekend of spring semester of our senior year, like we'd planned to do in college, and then in our first apartment, and our second, and our third, like we'd imagined doing forever when the world was still alive enough to think we might have a future. Lila ran a hand down my side, and I shivered at the softness of her touch as she said, I want to adopt a cat. I laughed. From where? Pet cemetery? It's not funny. I forgot sometimes that Lila was better at imagining than I was. I kissed her palm. I'm sorry. After the second night, when the voices faded and it seemed safe to come out, we tried to open the fridge. It wouldn't budge. We spent hours using the stick as a lever to pry it open. We wedged cans of beans under the lip to give us more space to work. We took breaks when we couldn't push anymore, near tears from exhaustion and fear, coated in sweat that left us slick against each other. When the stick broke, I pretended for Lila's sake that I was glad it was still wedged tightly enough to give us air to breathe. Something else they don't tell you. You'll forget the good. The smell of fresh air and baked bread, the bruised pinks and purples of a sunset over the mountains, the feeling of warm water rushing over pebbles and toes. I won't let it take my last good memory. Lila had spotted the flowers a week ago. She always was the one to find beauty in the world for both of us, and she'd squeezed my hand as her barely audible gasp joined the smoky air. Little more than weeds, the shock of orange stole my breath away. Two blooms growing against a burned-out building, clinging to each other for strength as they tried to survive. I was crying as I turned us both away from the sight. I didn't know why. 
It had been pitch black for days. Even the watery sliver of light that used to come through the crack in the fridge door extinguished. Time moved differently in the dark, but I think it was the third night it happened. Between one blink and the next, there and gone and there again. Lila never noticed I'd left my body. But I didn't leave her as if I could protect her, save her, even then. She hung on for an entire day, not noticing I'd stopped replying to her whispers. I couldn't imagine how she wasn't afraid, but she'd always been stronger than me. It wasn't surprise so much as relief that crested over me when she finally whispered, can we have one last slumber party? Of course, silly. I stroked her hair, ignoring the sharpness of her skull, the hollows of her cheeks. I kept my vigil until her heart slowed to a stop, her gasps settled, her body stilled. What they don't tell you about dying at the end of the world is that it's easy. Hi. I say as her spirit joins mine in the dusky air. Lila blinks, blue eyes now gray and round with surprise. It doesn't hurt anymore. No, I say, threading our fingers together. You ready? Yes. I pull her away from the fridge, sighing at the tension that releases as I finally allow myself to follow the thread that's been tugging me onward since I died. It feels like our first kiss, like everything is right. As we rise toward the ceiling, I glance toward the fridge. Lila's gaze follows mine, but I sharply tuck her away. Don't look. This time, Lila pulls back, turns. Her grip tightens in mine, and she says, whisper soft, oh, thank you.